All right, and yeah. Um, sorry, our, so yeah, this is how we documented all the infestations, and so we've got several thousand photos of this. Um, and yeah, move forward. Um, So, yeah, and as we're talking about, we had the monitoring blocks, which are very effective. Um, one of the interesting things, because when you look at literature, it will tell you that once the beetle lays eggs, it will then die. But nowhere, again, I've gone through probably about, you know, over 100 references. Nobody says how long it takes for the Death Watch beetle to die after laying eggs. But on these blocks, we're finding a lot of dead beetles. So we're guessing it may be just shortly after laying eggs. We don't know. We're doing more research to find that thing out because that's one of the interesting things in the entomological world, even though, you know, there's a lot of stuff that's known, but there's still a lot of stuff that isn't known. Um, next, Chris. And some of the things we also use too, um, we use just normal sticky traps because the beetles are attracted to light so a lot of times you'll find them on the windows and so we use yellow sticky traps that in some cases worked very effectively others didn't then we did some experiment with um you see using a pheromone that's actually for drugstore beetles which are extremely close relatives of the death watch beetle and you know that unfortunately didn't pan out um, so next, please. So some of the damage we get to these, and it's and it's funny when we first discovered these. You know, I had to do presentations, tell them what we had, and you know, some people got it when you just say, you know, the beetles are like termites, and you know, they do significant damage, and you know. Other people didn't get said, well, you know, yes, I'm overweight, but when I walk on the floor in building 64 here, the floor moves. You almost think you're having an earthquake. Um, and so because of that damage, you know, we've had ch chimneys collapse. Um, we had, because years ago, and part of the thing that happens like you say with these beetles they're really attracted to the moisture on the very back side of um this building when we had it re-roofed they didn't finish building and or i should say didn't finish building they didn't completely put the roof on so water actually came in and got it um we have a question about how did the beetle get on the island we don't know for sure but as we talked about earlier, I believe they, you know, may have, I mean, they may have came on other items that were brought in um, to the island. They, there's a possibility they flew. Um, but, you know, we, we really don't know. Um, you know, that's the $64 million question. But we think, you know, given the nature of this beetle, it was probably caught in the air currents landed in the trees, then moved into the buildings. And one of the things is these beetles like very moist conditions. We don't think there was much activity when the prison was in operation. But once it was closed, because we had folks who came through, doors were broken, things like that. And so it wasn't until recent years that we started finally shuttering a lot of these buildings and addressing a lot of these issues. Um, because, you know, it is just so extremely expensive to do work out there. It's hard to try and get a lot of this stuff done. But we're now looking, you know, at doing this. I mean, it I guess it was kind of fun when I gave a talk to our upper management about what we're finding, what the damage is. And after I finished my presentation for three minutes, nobody could say anything. The superintendent actually told me, said, that's amazing. We've never had a day like that where nobody had any comments because we we're kind of stunned going like, 
Oh my gosh, this is a serious problem. Uh, next, Chris. And so some of the things that you know are really scary about the beetle damage is, you know, we have historical things like in the cell house, we have the altar left from when it was a chapel. The beetles are in that. Um, in the cell house control room, even though that is actually not historical, um, that was all stuff made for a movie, but it's now old enough that, you know, it's getting to almost be classified as historical, but it also, you know, a lot of the other artifacts in there are historical, but the Beatles are damaging that. Um, next, please. And one of the things, you know, when, and as I said, I, I did do presentations to a lot of our staff on the damage the Beatles do. And the building on the right is what's known as quartermaster's building. It's left over, it was built by the army when they were there. And it just recently went through a major um, restoration. But one of the things, you know, they were planning to replace the, because it has a um, aluminum roof, they were replacing, gonna replace that, but they were not gonna replace the trusses until as they were taking off the roofing, they were holding on to the trusses and the trusses were just breaking because they were just full of powder post beetle um, tunnels. And all of a sudden that got out we go, oh, this is much more serious than we thought. And they're also going, you didn't lie to us. I said, no, yeah, this is the type of stuff you don't lie about because this stuff you need to jump on to right away. Um, Two years ago, there was a church in the Central Valley that a half hour before the service began, the ceiling collapsed and all from powder post beetles. Everybody said, well, we'll get to it one of these days. Next, please. You know, and we have things that, you know, the photo with all the tools, that was from the new industries building. And so as, um, folks would check out a tool, you know, a guard could look and see what tools were missing that somebody didn't check out so they could then track down things. But that's just infested with beetles. And, you know, that's that's history and that's stuff the Park Service is mandated to protect so that, you know, when Chris saw it a couple of years ago, when Chris brings his great grandkids there, our mission is to make sure that it's still there and it's intact, just like the desk that's in there that's all infested with beetles so you know we we have a lot of historical items that are missed because you know we I've, get people who go oh well why don't you just buy a replacement and, and you know that sounds and that's an easy thing but the thing is is you know you you know do you want to see a desk that's a replica of the desk that you know al capone sat on when he talked to a guard or do you want to see the real thing you know, people really want to see the real thing. And also, too, with some of our buildings are old enough that there's things that, you know, where we have square headed nails. Those are hard to find. And people really look and people are really amazed to see some of the old things that did happen, not replicas. Um, next, please. Yeah, you know, and one of the sad things, when we first started looking at some of the buildings, we just had it's a few, but every building on the island, every, um, the rubble buildings, because what you're seeing right now, the big part um, is apartments and things that are built, while the apartment buildings to the left were built in the 40s, the other buildings were built in the, um, I believe it was 1910, but they're all now rubble piles. They're all infested with beetles. So every structure is infested to one degree or another. Um, so next, please. So one of the things, as Chris said, you know, this isn't an easy task working in a national park. If you look on the UC pest notes, it'll usually tell you that, you know, for powder post beetles, for small infestations, you just replace the wood and move on with our 
the regulations pertaining to historic reservation, um, that is not an option. We want to keep everything as historical as possible. There are regulations guide, guiding us and maintaining that, managing that we do follow those things. So at times it makes it really hard. And sometimes that's why it makes some of the options, it doesn't always make sense, make sense. Some um, things, fumigation with historic preservation folks, they love it because all you do, you tent the building, fumigate it, and then move on. Um, where if you're looking at traditional things, yeah, you'd solve the water problem. Yeah, you know, why is it um, favorable conditions for the termites? Then replace the damaged wood, and you know, so it's a little easier. But I mean, on doing the historic preservations, it's it's a much more bigger challenge. Um, it and the regulations are very specific. Um, it's not like some things where there's a lot of gray or in room. Uh, next, please. So yeah, in structural fumigation, it can it can be when it's done right, it can be very effective. But I mean, other things that can be challenging, things like especially Building 64, the old several story barrack where we have the major damage, it's been renovated because originally it started out as army barracks, which at that time, army barracks were huge rooms, um, almost like, I don't know, um, massive things where you might have 50 or more people sleeping in one room, not like the army barracks of today that may have two or three people in a room. Um, you know, and the gas, will, when done right, actually penetrates into a lot of hidden spots. But the problem is, too, it, you know, under ideal condition, it does penetrate into all the spots and does a good job. But if they don't apply it right or the building has voids that um, just by the very nature of the construction of the voids, the gas doesn't get in there. But what's really important, they are, the um, those are killed pretty much instantly. I mean, the gas is deadly. Um, you know, and one of the things that always kind of puzzles me when you see the fumigation tarps, they look more like a circus tent. And, you know, you start to think, is that really good? You know, does that attract kids to it? And, you know, there are numerous cases where people have done things, you know, people have broken into buildings that are being fumigated and they never come back out. Um, next, please. But there's, you know, challenges um, to fumigation. Um, building 64, this is on the back side. It has a um, um, cover, uh, not a, a walkway between the second and third floors. Then there are bridges going across at the top floor and we can't remove those. So it means we would have to build scaffolding at an estimated cost of a quarter of a million dollars to bring the tarps out, because when you have the tarps, you know, that keeps the gas in the structure. So we'd have to bring the tarps out to places where we can seal it, which means to do that building in the additional space because of the tarp, we'd have to use 108 cylinders of fumigant. And that's massive. And, you know, there's the other logistics. If, you think, if you're having that many cylinders on the island, and this building is right at the dock where everybody gets on and off the boat to get on the island. So you really don't want to have that type of toxic material around your only way on or off the island. And that would mean closing the island. But next, please. But, you know, in one of the biggest things you have to remember, fugans have no residual. So as soon as you take off the tarp, you can be exposed for new infestations. And when you look at our slide from a few slides back, 
all the building sites have beetles. So it doesn't make sense to just treat one building when you have beetles flying all over because once the beetles emerge from the wood, they go out and seek new homes. So, you know, you either want to treat everything at once or find a different option. Next, please. You know, and then we've had um, say, well, why don't you use heat to control buildings? And in the park, we've used heat to control termites and other things very successfully. But one of the problems on Alcatraz, almost every building is concrete or brick. And concrete and brick are just heat sinks. So you'll never get the heat up to the temperature you need to kill the beetles. In other places, like in Building 64, where the interior is all dried wood, there are, well, it warps the wood um, and you get, you know, cause extensive damage. There have been a few cases where it started in spontaneous combustion. And, you know, we have no fire department on Alcatraz. We have no running water. I mean, our water comes in five gallon um, containers. So, you know, we, we've got to be really cautious at what we do on that. Um, next, please. Using borates. Borates is a good thing, but you have to think of the one nice thing about borates, it'll prevent new infestations, but what it doesn't control what's in the wood immediately. And depending on how large the wood is, it may take years before the beetles um, come out because I mean there sometimes the beetles will be living there for as much as um, 10 years before they emerge and contact the borates because if you look the photo down below the, the coloration around that's the borates um, how it penetrates the wood um, but what's nice one of our options too is that you borates can come out as a foam so you can inject them between walls because you can apply borates to painted surfaces. It just will not penetrate. But, you know, we're looking and doing some work with filling in between the walls. Next, please. So one of the other things that we're trying to do, um, deal with sanitation as prevention measures, because, you know, as somebody else has said, you know, they're curious um, how the beetles got out there and, is a very good chance that they may have came in pallets. Pallets are notorious for carrying wood destroying organisms on them. Um, we get pallets all the time to resupply our bookstore, our water supply, things like that. So now we have policies in place that we try and get the pallets off the island within a week. Um, we're removing all sorts of wood debris because one of the things we get a lot of times when we have contractors out there it is so expensive hauling things on boats. You know, a lot of times they'll kind of just leave things as we, you know, may not have had somebody check to make sure they removed all their debris and all their equipment. Um, so we've had a lot of issues with that, but we're now working to remove a lot of that. And we found that, you know, removing that because it's basically doing population control because if a beetle has no food source, you know, they can't reproduce as much. And it's gotten to times where, you know, we've had some really <laughs> amazing infestated areas. Um, we Normally these beetles like softer wood, but in one building, because there was such a huge infestation, they actually went to about 50 pieces of hand tools, shovels, things like that, which are hardwoods. And, you know, we ended up having to throw all that out just because the handles were just completely damaged. And it was kind of scary when you have a, Acts that you could put your finger on the handle and it'll actually cave in. Um, next, please. So, yeah, any, I think now is a good time to open up for any questions. I have one. Yes, go ahead. How many? 